Well, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. Palm Sunday, one of those Sundays on the calendar, very widely known, celebrated Sunday. It's an event in the Bible that's recorded in all four Gospels. That's rare that something be in all four of the Gospels. So that's telling us something. It's a very interesting Sunday. We're going to start off a little bit awkwardly, okay? A little bit awkwardly. We're going to read a parable that's going to seem to have nothing to do with what we're talking about. But I'm going to tie it in before it's all done, okay? We're going to read it, and it's just going to have to sit there. We'll circle back by the end. The parable is in Luke 13. The parable is in Luke 13. I'm going to read it real fast, and then we're going to uh, introduce what we're talking about. Normally, you don't read something before you've introduced it. Luke 13, in verse 6, this is called the parable of the barren fig tree. It says, and he, Jesus, Jesus told them a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've been seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Okay, so that's a parable. It's going to seem to have nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's going to tie in by the end, I assure you. Uh, this morning we're we're talking about, I've entitled this series, God's Plan for the Resurrection. I'm not good with titles. I don't know if this is a great title. What I'm trying to convey is that we're building up to Easter Sunday, the Sunday of the Resurrection. And this was an event that there are many, many prophecies. And beyond even prophecies, there's a lot of foreshadowing. So that's not a prophecy per se, but there's a lot of imagery that was put in place beforehand for God to reveal what was going to happen in the fullness of time. And we looked at that foreshadowing two Sundays ago with the Passover, right? We talked about how there was this whole event happening thousands of years, over a thousand years before Jesus even came. And the imagery of that event, the Passover, was so strong, it was as if God was screaming to the people, don't miss this. One of the things I don't know if I made explicitly clear is that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, that was the day that they were sacrificing lambs over in the temple. So the Passover lambs are being sacrificed at the same time Jesus himself was being hung on the cross. And the imagery there is unmistakable. The timing is not coincidental. 1 Corinthians 5-7 makes it explicitly clear that Christ is our Passover. That's actually how it's worded there. And so God was doing something very, very specific and very intentional with that. Today we're going to look at a couple of other prophecies that come out in this passage, the passage of the triumphal entry, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. There's two prophecies, one that you're going to be very familiar with, the other that you may not be from, as familiar with. In my opinion, it's the greatest prophecy in all of Scripture, it's going to, if you've never heard it before, you're going to be amazed that this is in the Bible. It is actually life-changing if you've never heard this prophecy that we're going to talk about this morning. I'm so excited to get to it. Okay, uh, but is prophecy important? Why is it important? Confirms the word. Put that verse up there on the screen, Holly. What does Isaiah 41, 22, and 24, 2, 24 say? This is God talking. God says to the people, let, uh, let them bring them, talking about idols, let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Next verse. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. So God is talking about idols here. Tell us the future then. If you're, if you're gods, tell us the future. That we may know that you're gods. Do good or do harm that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing 
and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. So God is denouncing idols here, basically saying, you know what? Here, we can prove right away who's God and who's not. Who's telling the future? Are idols doing this? They are not. Are they doing anything? In fact, no. <laughs> that comes out with Elijah on Mount Carmel, right? But this is very specifically saying this is confirmation that God is true and that God is real. If there is no predicting of the future or if his words don't come true, then that is the opposite, right? God is not true. God is not God. But the fact that God can predict the future, that is proof that he is who he says he is. This is that confirmation. Uh, and it's so, so important. It, it shows that it, the thing is we cannot predict the future because we're inside of time. We, all of us humans exist in the realm of time. If he can predict the future, that means he must be outside of time. He transcends us. He is something other than us. He's something greater than us. My ways are not your ways. My uh, thoughts are higher than your thoughts, God says. He is very much other. Okay, but I've personally, growing up in the church, I, I actually have a little bit of a uncomfortableness when talking about prophecy because so many things over the years, uh, let's just say that Christian leaders have a tendency to not be very good at interpreting prophecy, right? So we had this, uh, I remember we had this speaker when I was just a little kid come to my church and he had been to Israel, and that was like a really big thing, like, wow, he's been to Israel. And I remember him talking about, at that time, saying, Mount Carmel is already starting to split in two, he said. Now, if you know the prophecy, Mount Carmel is supposed, or not Mount Carmel, uh, Mount of Olives, right? Yeah, Jesus uh, touches down, he's going to come back, he's going to come again, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives, and it says that the Mount of Olives is going to split, in two, and there's going to be a big valley in between them. Now, that is what the prophecy says, but this man came to our church and said, that's already starting to happen. There's already a crack forming on the Mount of Olives, and so it's any day now. Now, is it true that God is coming back any day? Yes, we don't know the time of the hour. It's imminent. It could be any moment, so that is a true statement, but it's his reasoning. Uh, I, it's been 30 years now, and I see no evidence that there's actually a crack uh, on the Mount of Olives. I don't know where he got that. Uh, I can't find anything on the, the internet to confirm that that was actually the case. So that's just kind of a, one of those things where it's like, well, it, is, it prof is prophecy true? You know, it puts that little seed of doubt in your head when you hear a Christian leader talking about something, claiming it to be God's prophecy and it doesn't come true. Um, you know, there's, there's a there was a preacher who talked about, and Holly, you don't have to put this up on the screen. There was a preacher who really uh, famously talked about the blood moons about 10 years ago. I don't know if you remember that. There was four lunar eclipses right in a row, and they fell on Jewish ho holy days, uh, some of them. And so he was very famous and made a lot of money selling his book on the blood moon prophecies on how something was going to happen in Israel's prophetic history at the culmination of those four lunar eclipses. Now, that was about 10 years ago. We can't point to anything that happened from that. So that was another time where if you're a skeptic, perhaps, and you're listening to this famous preacher talking about uh, these, these prophecies and how this is lining up with current events, and then nothing happens, you say, well, I don't know about that. I guess the, the Bible isn't true. Um, put this one up on the screen, Holly. It's called, uh, this is a man named Ronald Wineland. Uh, he wrote this book called 2008, God's Final Witness. He wrote this in 2006. He claimed to be one of the two witnesses from Revelation. And uh, he knew who the other witness was, uh, but that witness, he didn't believe it yet. So he was working on him. But he actually set the date that Jesus would establish his kingdom here on earth. May 27th, 2012. That was actually the third date he put out after the first two didn't come true. Um, this man, it also would appear that he enriched himself uh, from this uh, facade, this hoax. Uh, he was indicted on tax evasion charges. He was living quite high on the hog. The point is that Christian leaders often misinterpret prophecy, and it 
dirties God's name, right? Because it looks bad, it reflects poorly on him because it's been poorly interpreted. Mis it's been misinterpreted. And uh, it gives skeptics, it gives agnostics firepower when they're, you know, mocking, making a mockery of our faith. Uh, there's a man named Bert Ehrman. He's a biblical scholar in every sense of the word, except he's totally agnostic. And um, this is one of the things that he talks about. Growing up in the 70s and 80s, everything was related to current events, everything in the prophecies. But now it's 30, 40 years later, and now everything is still about the current events. He says, well, I thought it was about the 70s. Is it not about the 70s anymore? So a lot of skepticism. So I can understand why some people, when we start talking about prophecies, we start talking about biblical prophecies, would start to, uh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I've heard a lot of things, and it hasn't met up, or it hasn't matched up with what I've seen. I can understand that, but that's why we're going to look at two prophecies here this morning, and we're going to look at it from kind of a skeptic's point of view, and I think that it's going to be life-changing, like I said, so stick with me here. It is about the triumphal entry, though. We are talking about that this morning. Okay, it relates to this passage that we're talking about. Let's turn there to Matthew 21. Like I said, this is recorded in all four Gospels. All four Gospels talk about the triumphal entry. If you read them really carefully, they are talking about slightly, they, they point out different things, they highlight different things, they focus on different aspects of this event because they all have their own purpose when they're writing their books. And so they're trying to highlight different things, different aspects of the same event. Matthew is focusing on the kingness or the kingship of Jesus Christ, how he is the, the heir to David's throne, how he will rule and reign on the earth, how he will establish a, a kingdom, uh, like the false prophet that we just talked about. He, <laughs> the point is right. Christ will establish his kingdom here on earth. Uh, but he was wrong on that date, and he's not one of the witnesses of Revelation. Matthew 21. So Jesus has been performing his ministry for about three years at this point, uh, a little bit longer than three years. He's been going around, and now he's at the point where it's drawing to a close. And he is making his way now. He's traveling, physically traveling from one place to another. He's outside of Jerusalem, the capital. He's making his way there. And it says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem... Okay, so they're going that direction and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He gives his disciples instructions, go into town. You're going to see a donkey tied up there. And just go ahead and bring them. Tell them that I need it. And that's what happens. The other Gospels, the, the owner comes out and says, what are you doing? The master needs it. Okay. So they take it and they bring it to Jesus. And it says that they're fulfilling a prophecy here. If you would put this on the screen, um, Holly. Zechariah 9.9. 9. This is hundreds of years before uh, Jesus came to earth. It says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there is a prophecy that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. Note the place. Zion and Jerusalem are often used interchangeably. Jesus will be coming there, the Messiah, their king. He's going to ride a donkey. And what is he bringing? Salvation. Having salvation is he. Now, when Zechariah the prophet uses this term salvation, he's not thinking about it like we typically think about it, right? We think about asking uh, forgiveness for our sins and then dying and go to heaven. Like that's what we think when we say the word salvation very typically. Um, but what Zechariah and what a reader of Zechariah originally would have been thinking when they read that 
is they're thinking about a sal salvation from occupation, from foreign occupation, from foreign um, rule. So if you read the rest of Se uh, Zechariah 9, very worth reading on your own time. Uh, it's, it has a lot of this imagery in there. It talks about removing chariots. It talks about removing the war horses. It talks about um, the Messiah's global rule. It says he'll reign from sea to sea. So we are talking about a kingdom here. It talks about material abundance as well. It's, there'll be plenty of grain. There'll be plenty of wine. And so there's a lot of good things that are promised in this kingdom. All of this is inclusive in the Zechariah 9 prophecy. So that's what they're thinking of when it says salvation, bringing salvation. That's what they're thinking. And uh, that is what is going on in Zechariah 9. Okay, so we see that there's this prophecy that he's going to ride a donkey. And so Jesus sends the disciples into the town. They get the donkey and they bring him. Specifically, it's a young donkey. Um, we don't know how old, but it says that it's the, the foal, the colt of a donkey. And so it actually appears that maybe there, there's actually two donkeys here, right? The mother and the baby. And it appears that maybe they're leading the mother donkey and Jesus is riding on the, the younger one. And if you've ever seen a donkey, they're, they're not very big uh, as they are. A young one is even smaller. Perhaps Jesus' feet are even dragging on the ground here, okay? This isn't as majestic as some of the kids' uh, drawing books make it look, okay? This, is, this is, looks strange. They're leading the mother donkey. It seems that the younger one is perhaps falling along. Let's keep reading in verse 6. It says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. And others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And so, yeah, this is Pretty peculiar, and this is where we get the term Palm Sunday, right? So we see here they're throwing their coats, their cloaks in the, in the road. They're cutting tree branches, palm tree branches. They're laying it on the road. It's kind of like rolling out the red carpet, right? He's, the donkey's like trotting on. They're not going to touch the ground. He's going to walk on a nice padded carpet so to speak. They're paving the way for him, rolling out the red carpet. And uh, this is something that was very known in this time period, in this period of uh, the first century in the Roman world. This is called a triumph procession. And so uh, if you got that picture there, Holly, um, the Romans would do this very typically. And this is a, a painting. It's in the museum in Paris, the Lou or whatever they call it, the Louvre. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not into art. But uh, yeah, this is uh, the triumph of Titus and Vespasian. And so they had a military victory, and then they ride back into town, and the, the crowds are all excited, and so they're having this triumphal procession. And so this was very common in the, in the Roman world at that time. And so this is kind of what the people are doing here. They're seeing their king coming, right? And so they're celebrating this with a, a triumphal procession. Now, what's really interesting here is that the people start saying, Hosanna. That's a nice word, isn't it? Hosanna. I like how that sounds. They just make up a nice little word right there. And because uh, it sounded nice, they, they like this, this idea that they had. Let's just say Hosanna. Now, what does that mean? Do we know what Hosanna means? That's right. Julie just said it. Save us. So this is a, they're saying it in Greek, Hosanna. It's actually coming from two Hebrew words that mean save us. So they're shouting at him, save us. What is the, the king riding on the donkey bringing? Salvation. They're shouting, save us. And they're actually doing more than just shout, save us. They're quoting scripture. They have memorized scripture and they are quoting it here. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. 
What are they saying? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a messianic psalm. So if you know the psalms, there are many different kinds of psalms. There are psalms that are just praise and adoration. There are psalms where David's just mad and angry about his enemies. Those are called precatory psalms. But then there's also messianic psalms that are pointing towards the Messiah. And this is one of those messianic psalms. And so the people, when they see him on the donkey, they start quoting this prophecy of the Messiah at him. They start saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're recognizing that he is the Messiah. Yeah, let's turn over to Luke 19. We're going to be jumping around here this morning. Luke 19, this is a, the same event, but Luke gives us a couple more details here of what happens. By the way, they're still outside of Jerusalem. Does that make sense? They're, he's on the road to Jerusalem. He has not crossed through the gates yet. So the capital city people, there's, some of them came out, but by the, by the most part, they're still inside the city. Much, much, much of the leadership is still inside the city. Some are outside. They're watching what's going on. That's why in Matthew, when they get into the city, they're like, who is this? It's like, what is all this commotion? Who is this guy? And they're like, this is the prophet Jesus. Okay, but they're still outside the city at this point in Luke's gospel, Luke 19, verse 39. This is right after, I'll read verse 38 here to connect it. The people were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So what's happening here is that they're hearing a Messianic psalm quoted to him. Jesus, they're, they're quoting the psalm that you're the Messiah. That's what they're saying to you right now. You need to tell them that that is wrong. Rebuke them. He says, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. If I told them to be quiet, the rocks would start saying it. Like that is how obvious that this moment is, that even a rock would start talking. And what is interesting is Jesus, if you, if you read the Gospels, he heals somebody and they're like, you're the Messiah. And he's like, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. My time hasn't come. Because he realizes that if he claims to be the Messiah overtly, out loud, unequivocally, it's going to cause a confrontation that is going to lead to his death. And his ministry was not done earlier in those previous years. So he's not ready to have that confrontation that leads to his death. So you're the Messiah. Don't tell anybody. Now he's, they're saying, you're the Messiah. He's saying, I'm not shutting you up. If I shut you up, even the rocks would cry out. This is the time that we're having this confrontation. I am claiming to be the Messiah. And the, it's going to cause a problem with the leadership. <laughs> and sure enough, they're saying, teacher, rebuke your disciples. No. It's interesting that this, this story is housed uh, also what happened right before the triumphal entry. He healed two blind men. And the blind men were saying, son of David, have mercy on us. Even the blind can see that he's the Messiah. Even the rocks will testify that he's the Messiah. This is unmistakably Jesus Christ is who all the prophets have been pointing to. And the time has come. Jesus is saying, yes, I'm accepting this. So he's not going to shut them up. And uh, if we keep reading here, it says, when he, Jesus, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. And this word here, if you, you know the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. If that word for weep, it, it's like he, he, a tear came out. It's a very weak word for, for weeping. He, he shed a tear. Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus up again. But this weeping here, it's like a person at a funeral. The wailing. The wailing that people have done at funerals uh, in, in, 
in the New Testament, that's the same Greek word that's used here. Jesus is quite upset. Not like when he wept with Lazarus. I mean, he was upset, but hey, I'm going to raise him up. But here he's weeping. This is a, like a funeral wail. And Jesus said, Would that you, even you, had known on, the day, on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and, you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. This happened in 70 AD, if you know the story, and it's really bizarre when you read one stone not left on top of another. I mean, that's a little bit extreme, right? You can destroy a city without uh, turning up all the stones. They actually did. They set fire to the temple, and it melted the gold into the rocks, and so they wound up pulling all the stones off of each other to try to get the gold out. So they actually did tear one, not one stone was on top of another. This prophecy came true. Jesus is saying, you're asking... Uh, for salvation, uh, but that's not what's coming at this point. Uh, if only you'd have known for the things that make peace. Now, they should have known from the donkey prophecy, right? But let's look at this from a skeptic's eye. If I am a con artist in the first century, and I want to claim to be the Messiah, and I know the prophecies... I can go get a donkey, can I? I can go get a donkey and ride that into town. And then say, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm fulfilling this prophecy. I can, I can orchestrate those events if I'm, a, if I'm a con artist. Can I? There's some prophecies that Jesus couldn't fake, right? Being born in Bethlehem. You can't, you can't pick where you're, you're born, right? You can't do that. So, but this kind of a prophecy, the donkey, yeah. If I'm a... If I'm a Con artist, I can play this to my advantage. And perhaps a skeptic would look at that this way. Uh, let's now talk about a prophecy that cannot be explained other than God is real and he predicted the future. Okay, so why does Jesus say you did not know the time of your visitation? I think there's a reason. It's in Daniel chapter 9, okay? You guys are going to turn there. We're going to do something different this morning. All right? I'm actually going to pull out this pad of paper over here. Somebody was like, why don't you use a computer? I said, well, because I'm not smart enough for that. We're going to use old school paper. Turn to Daniel 9. We're going to, we're going to do this here. How many of you have heard the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy? Raise your hand. Like you know what that is? Oh, wow. That's a lot of people. I grew up. I could tell you the most obscure Bible story as a kid. I had never heard this one. I had never heard this one. Uh, I was in my 20s, I guess. And uh, it blew my mind that this was in the Bible. It is absolutely incredible. We're going to draw it out here. If you're a skeptic, stick with me. This is, this is crazy. This is... Uh, this is crazy. All right. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Ready? This is called the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy. It says 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war of desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and, suffer and, and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. 
even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. What we have here, uh, several things that are promised are going to take place in this 70-week span. Um, one of the things is to make reconciliation for iniquity. Has that happened? It has. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He took the sins of the world upon him. He paid the price on the cross. God accepted his perfect sacrifice when he raised him from the dead. Reconciliation for iniquity has been done. Not all the things in this prophecy have been done. There's things that are saved for the final week of the prophecy. Um, but we're going to look at the first 69 weeks here. Now, how long is a week? Seven days, Seven days right? Okay, the... What Daniel is saying here isn't actually weeks. It can mean weeks, but it's literally seven. So there's 70 sevens is what Daniel says. Now, sometimes seven in the Bible means a week. Sometimes it means the Sabbath, but other times it literally means seven. And prophetically here, we know that it means a year. Each day is a year. So a week is seven years. Okay, I have notes. If you want to check this out later, we're not going to get into it, but later in the, the book, it does talk about how many days are in a week, okay? And it's, and it's, not, uh, it's not seven. It's like 1,200 something, right? So it's uh, many days, and so from that, you're like, oh, each day is representing a year. So these weeks are seven years each, okay? Each week is seven years. So it's a prophetic week. So, 70 times 7 is how long? 490 what? Years. Now, can you read that in the back? No? All right, I'm going to have to do it bigger, huh? All right, we'll leave that. 490, you know it's there. All right. Now, here's the thing. Their years are not our years. You know that? We use something called a Gregorian calendar. That didn't come about until 1582. So now we use the sun for our calendars. They used to use the moon. And so their years were 360 days long. Okay, now we have 365. Okay, you can look that up if you don't believe me, but that's how it used to be. Their years were 360 days. So we have to remember that Daniel's writing this back before our calendar, so we have to convert some things. All right, so we're dealing with 69 weeks here. So if 69 weeks... How about that? 69 weeks. If each week is a year, how many years is that? You might have to pull out your calculators here. No, each, each week is seven years. So this is 69 times seven. 483. Okay, is that our years or their years? Theirs. All right, so let's multiply this. Who's got their calculator out? Yeah? Let's multiply this by 360. That's their days. That's how many days are in their years. 173,880 173, days. That's how long Daniel is referring to here when he says 69 weeks. He says for seven weeks and 62 weeks, right? That's 69. That's his years. That's how many days he's referring to. All right, divide this number by 365 to talk about our years. 476. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. All right. Okay, the prophecy is dealing with 476 of our years. Okay, now... What is the starting point of this prophecy? It tells us right here. From what? There it is. Say it again, Tiffany. From the command to rebuild Jerusalem. That's our starting point. Rebuild Jerusalem. Now, it wasn't very long ago that Ed taught about this. There are times where the Israelites went back to Israel, but there was not a command to rebuild the city. There was times that they were allowed to rebuild the temple, but there was a decree 
to, re fulfill, uh, to rebuild the city, there's only one decree in the Bible that that happens, and that's in Nehemiah 2. You remember? Nehemiah was a cup holder to the king, and he was troubled because the city lay in ruin. He said, what's bothering you? He said, my city is destroyed. He said, what do you want? He said, I need, I need wood. I need this. I need safe passage. He said, here's a letter for all these people. That's a decree. So that's a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. So from that point, what year was that? Do we know? In fact, we do. Who was the king? Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes I. Now, I'm going to prove to you guys again that I'm not just, this isn't funny business. Look this up. What year did Artaxerxes start reigning? Look, look it up on uh, Google it right now. You're close. This isn't disputed. All, I mean, there's, there's literally no de debate among the scholarly community when Artaxerxes I started reigning. 465. All right. I'm going to put this number here, 465. That is the beginning of King Artaxerxes. He is the one who is talking to Nehemiah and says, yes, you can go and rebuild this city. And we studied that for several Sundays uh, with, with Ed, them rebuilding the city. It says they're going to rebuild during a troublesome time. Now, when was that? In Nehemiah, it says it was in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, in the month of Nisan. Okay? 465, we're actually going to uh, make sure that we go the right way here, right? Because this is BC, right? So we're going to subtract 20 from this number. What does that give us? 445. Now, from their perspective, his reign is going to be from 445. That 20th year is going to bleed into 444. Does that make sense? If you start midway through 445, you keep going for a year, you're into 444 now. And that's still the 20th year. Month of Nisan is very early in the year. Very likely that we're talking 444 here, right? If you don't start right away in 445, it bleeds into 444. Nisan is an early month. That's our starting point here. Is it, everyone still tracking with me? The start of the prophecy starts at 444 BC, or BCE now they're making us say. Okay, 69 weeks, 476 of our years. Okay, now if we start here and we have that many years, what is 476 minus 444? 32. But here's one thing that we've got to remember. There is no year zero. It went from 1 BC to 1 AD. No year zero. So we've got to add in one year there for, to account for uh, year zero. What does that give us? 33 AD. When do you think Jesus rode into town on the donkey? There is strong, strong evidence that Jesus rode into town on the donkey in 33 AD. Why is that? We know that uh, Jesus was crucified on a Friday, right? Because they had to get him off the cross quickly because it was almost the Sabbath. But we also know that it was on a Passover day. So a Passover on a Friday, when was that? There are four candidates within Jesus' lifetime. Only four times in Jesus' lifetime where Passover fell on a Friday. 33 AD was one of those years. And so the evidence points very strongly that, yeah, 33 AD was the year that Jesus died on the cross. Daniel predicted it. Now, it, we can, if we had more time, we could talk about how it's probably down to the day. But at the very least, this is a prophecy down to the very year. Now, what are our options here? Now, you've <laughs> Did I do any funny business here? I had you guys look up most of the thing. I feel like it's a magic trick here that I'm uh, performing on stage. But this is, this is crazy when you think about it. What are our options here? This is, this is predicting the future, is it not? Daniel uh, happened four or 500 years before Jesus was born. And he says, this is how long it's going to be until Messiah the Prince comes. 
and we have it down to the very year at the very least. So our options here are maybe they faked Daniel, right? After, after Jesus came into town on the donkey, and they looked and they said, let's make this really cool prophecy, and we can make it seem like it happened a long time ago, and uh, make it all come out. Now, that's not what happened. We know for a fact that Daniel was in the Septuagint. That's at least 100 years before Jesus was born. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. We have copies from before Jesus was born. So Daniel was written clearly before Christ. No debate on that. So maybe his disciples faked it after the fact. Jesus died, and so when they're writing their Gospels, they're like, let's make it come out so that like, it's perfect with Daniel's 70 weeks. Uh, also, that's not very likely at all. Because the disciples are constantly pointing back to specific prophecies. We just read one. He said, Matthew is all like, here he is riding in on a donkey, and here's the Zechariah prophecy that he's fulfilling. They don't call attention to Daniel's 70 weeks. So if they were faking it, don't you think that they would have called attention to it? They would have pointed that out. Like, look, it worked out. The math works out. They're not pointing it out. Uh, so the disciples aren't faking anything here. That's just unreasonable. Maybe Jesus was a con artist, right? And he knew what Daniel 70 weeks says, and he says, I've got to present myself in 33 AD. I've got to do it. Uh, it not likely, and here's why. It says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That's an idiom. It, the full idiom is cut off from the land of the living. Die. So if Jesus is faking it here because he knew the prophecy and he wanted to be Messiah and so he's going to make it all work out, he's also agreeing to die. Uh, no con artist would do that. No con artist would go that far to say, I'll die for this hoax. That's not how that works. The only other option that we're left with is that the prophecy is true. That God literally 476 years before the fact, said, this is when my Messiah is going to come. Yep. Remember the prophecy, or the, the, what we read in Isaiah? Let the idols tell what's going to come. Let them do that. No, I detest those idols because they cannot do what I can do. Here is God saying, this is when it's going to be, down to the day, down to, down to the year anyway. That is something that nobody can fake. It has to come from God. That has to be that God is real, that he is different from us, that he's higher than us, he exists outside of our time dimension. And it has to be that he loves us enough to communicate with us, right? Deists would believe that there's a God, but he's not interested in the affairs of men. No, this tells us that he also communicates with us. Let's go back to Matthew as we close out here this morning. As we uh, change times of the service, I have no idea what time I started preaching or what time I'm supposed to end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm establishing precedent this morning. We do two-hour services now. <laughs> Matthew 21, verse 18. Okay, so he's ridden into town. They've been shouting Hosanna, but the leadership is like, rebuke your disciples. Uh, he goes into the temple and cleanses it. It's a mess. The whole religious system is a mess. He's actually going to quote Jeremiah 7 at them, calling them a den of robbers. Um, but this is an interesting little, why is this here? It says in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Again, talking about Jesus. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went up to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. You know, uh, he's gonna, the disciples ask how that happened, and he explains how, but they didn't ask why it happened. So we're going to talk about the why a little bit here. 
you know, it's, it's a bizarre story, right? And Mark actually, I think it's Mark, actually goes as far as to say it wasn't fig season, right? Do you have fi- leaves on your figs right now? Yeah, do you have the figs itself? No. I had the same thing at my house. I have some figs. They're very leafy right now. I don't expect any fruit right now. It's, they just, the leaves are just coming back on. And that's kind of what this fig tree was. It was in leaf, but no fruit. And he curses the fig tree because there's no fruit on it. Uh, if, if my kids acted that way, I'd tell them that they need to change their attitude, right? Uh, what is Jesus doing here? Why is he doing this? It's a symbol of what is going on right now. Israel is the fig tree and they haven't produced that fruit he's looking for. It goes back to the parable that we read at the beginning of our message this morning. He keeps coming to this tree year after year and there's no fruit on it. And they say, well, let's, let's manure it. Let's like help it out a little bit. Give it some fertilizer. Maybe it'll bear fruit this year. And uh, I do that with my trees. I put fertilizer around them. Uh, so they'll be productive. And Jesus has been doing that with his ministry. Been traveling around, giving them sign after sign after sign, uh, fulfilling prophecy, making it so easy for them to believe, to accept him as the Messiah. And they're not bearing that fruit. Oh yeah, they're, they're leafy green. They're saying Hosanna. John makes it clear that they're still not believing though. They're still wanting what Jesus can provide They're like wanting certain aspects. They want uh, pieces of what Jesus is, but they don't want the person. They're not looking for the entirety of the person. John's gospel makes that a lot more clear. John's gospel, his purpose is that you believe. Um, So he's pointing out the disbelief there, and that's what's going on with these crowds. Yeah, they're leafy green, but they're not bearing that fruit that he's looking for. Uh, Holly, if you could put Jeremiah 8 up on the screen. You know, Jeremiah 7, I said, he quotes when he's in the temple. He says, this is a den of uh, thieves and robbers. And uh, Jeremiah 8 relates to this fig tree. It says, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall be among the fallen when I punish them. They shall be overthrown, says the Lord. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there were no, there are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed from them. Yeah, they're, they're wanting that salvation and deliverance from their enemy, but they're not wanting the salvation of their souls that he's offering them. And really, the story of the triumphal entry, it's kind of interesting that we celebrate it year after year after year uh, why it's on the calendar, because ultimately it's not a very happy story when you think about it. It's leafy green, but no fruit. And ultimately, it's a rejection of who Jesus is, rejection of his offer to be their king right then and there, to offer the kingdom that had been prophesied. Uh, They rejected their king, even though they were leafy green. And I think about that uh, quite a lot in our own lives, if we can try to draw a little bit of application uh, for this for us is that when God communicates with us, he, he expects something from that. He expects it to result in, in change in our thinking, our thinking leading to a change in behavior. But what he doesn't expect is that we just kind of sit there and say, that was nice, that was, that's pretty good. I like, uh, I like some of the things I, I heard. I, I like the, the be kind to other people. I think that's a, a good thing. And uh, I kind of like this... Uh, thinking about the, the life to come. You know, I, I'm not big on materialism. I'm like uh, minimalistic and kind of take these parts. It's like, I, Jesus, I've read your book and uh, really great points in there. Uh, I, I, you know, I, have, I, I have some ideas too that I think you might want to consider. That's how we approach God sometimes, right? We approach him with, uh, we take what we like and uh, we keep the other things that we like that are from us. And uh, it looks leafy green, but uh, not, not at all what he's looking for. He's looking for total acceptance of what he is saying, total faith, total belief in what he is uh, communicating with us. God has communicated with us, and he's continually communicating with us, and he's expecting a response based on that. Uh, Matthew 13 talks about to whom, uh, whom has been given, more will be given. To whom much is given, more will be given, but to him, uh, how does it go? Come on, I'm going to have to look it up now. I'm misquoting it. 
misquoting it. Oh, man. Miss Joan is mouthing it to me, trying to help. I have to look it up. Yeah. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So when God talks to us, when God communicates with us, like if we don't respond to that, right, he doesn't then give us something new. Does that make sense? Like if you don't respond to level three, you don't move on to level four. He keeps you there <laughs> until you are believing and accepting those words that he's giving you there. He keeps progressing with you. And so if you take his words, you receive them with eagerness, you accept them, you incorporate them into your thinking, your life. Well, then he takes you into something more. He takes you into something more, something more, something more. It's progress in your life. But if you don't respond to what he has given you, uh, even what you have is taken away. So it's a relational thing that we're talking about here this morning. So I think my encouragement is to you, man, you don't want to be that leafy green fig tree that looks good, that looks good, but it's not the substance that Jesus is looking for in his relationship with you, which is total, total. It's hard to really explain. It's hard to put into words because it's a, it's a relational thing. Does that make sense? It's a relational thing. It's a heart thing. It's so hard sometimes. Some things look so good on the outside, but Jesus sees right through and sees right to the heart. And only you can know for sure where you're at with the Lord in that. Only you can know for sure. But what I can know for sure is that Jesus is talking. This is one of those things that, like, this isn't something that you can just, if this was the first time you saw this, this isn't something that you can just go home and just be like, that was kind of cool. This is life-changing. Do you understand that? If you don't, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, because maybe you're not really sure about this, God's real. He spoke. This is 500 years in advance. What are you going to do with that? Are you just going to go home casually? Or are you going to initiate a relationship with God because you've seen that he is real and he's speaking? That's, you've got to do that. And if you're a believer, man, this is something that can really strengthen you in, in times of doubt. Sometimes we doubt God's presence. Sometimes we doubt his love and his communication. This is one of those things that you can't casually go home. This, this can change your life once you see that, yeah, God is real and he's speaking. But he's looking for response as well. He's looking for the correct response, which is faith, acceptance of who he is. So I, I think we've, we've, probably, we've probably hit enough time, yeah? <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth in your word. Father, while some people have uh, shed doubt on, on the truthfulness of your word, because they've misinterpreted it here and there. Uh, Father, we pray, we thank you that we have your word that is totally sure, totally reliable uh, when, we, when we understand it properly, when we, when we interpret it properly, properly, Lord. It's entirely reliable. And it's reliable because you're reliable. It's not, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists, it proceeds out of your mouth. It proceeds out of who you are. And because your word is reliable, we know that you're reliable. We know that we can trust you. We know that we can rely on you. We know that we can um, walk forward with you in faith, Lord, receiving what you're teaching us in the here and now and moving on to the things that you'll show us in, in uh, our days to come with you as we walk in right relationship with you. We thank you for your word, Lord, and uh, we pray that it uh, sinks down into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.